All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the 2012 drought today, specifically the links between precipitation deficits, high temperature, and hydrologic sensitivities. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Marty Herling, for his help uh, with this work, and also some of his previous work on the drought event that I'll reference throughout the talk. Okay, so the 2012 drought was really um, a, a unique meteorological event because it was it had a very rapid onset. Sometimes it's been called a flash drought and that was due largely to the lack of uh, springtime precipitation as well as summer thunderstorms. Uh, and this report here, or USA Today actually, um, drew on some of the conclusions from a NOAA drought task force report that Marty was a co-author on and perhaps others in this room that really describe those mechanisms. And so I just want to make the distinction that here I'm really going to focus just on the hydrologic sensitivities and take the atmospheric conditions sort of as they were and not really get into those mechanisms. So what I'm going to present is really a very simple synthetic experiment to try to understand the uh, influence of temperature and precipitation uh, individually and uh, together. So the impacts of the 2012 event, uh, many of you may have seen this image before. It depicts the um, historic grain yields in the U.S. Um, for each year. And you can see uh, the different p time periods are, uh, are sort of, there's a trend within each. And I, I should emphasize that those trends are not due to climate change, perhaps that's obvious, but uh, rather due to developments in farming practices and things like that. So departures from those trends can really be a, an interesting proxy for uh, drought. And so the 2012 event affected a large swath of the agricultural lands in the U.S. and hence led to a departure of about uh, 25 percent, the estimates as high as uh, 30 billion dollars in damage. Um, so to understand how severe first the meteorological conditions were, I'm showing here um, the growing season, so May through August, standardized anomaly of precipitation uh, from a data set that I uh, just developed for the Bureau of Reclamation. And what I'm showing here is, just to be clear on what a standardized anomaly is, basically I've got the 2012 uh, May through August precipitation. I subtract out the mean over uh, the reference period and divide by the standard deviation. So you end up with a, uh, basically just the number of standard deviations above or below the mean for each point. Clearly 2012 was, was dry. And uh, I wanted to kind of do a sanity check with this data set, so I compared it against published work, hurling at all 2014, which used climate division data, and the two generally check out, so that was, that was a good thing. Temperature, mean daily temperature, same kind of idea, uh, just to distinguish between the um, uh, hurling at all paper, they, they de uh, define the Great Plains using the, the following states, whereas we slightly altered this definition to basically keep things east of the continental divide, so everything is kind of um, hydrologically contiguous, and so from here on, I'm going to really focus on that domain going forward. Another way to contextualize the um, drought is simply a scatter plot. So I don't know if you can see there's, uh, you've got precipitation anomaly and actually temperature anomaly here is on the vertical axis. So this is for the central Great Plains domain. Each point is a year. I've got 64 years up there, but they're all standardized by the same reference period. And you can really see that there is some relationship here between precipitation and temperature that I'll emphasize um, in the next few slides. Just to give context, so 2012 was really a, um, a historic event in terms of both temperature and precipitation. It was greater than uh, two sigma in each of those. The other drought in recent memory, of course, is the 1988 drought, which was not as severe in um, during that time period, but was much longer lasting. Okay, so um, how severe was the drought? So to get at this, I'm actually going to answer a slightly different question, which is how severe were uh, simulated soil moisture deficits? And to do this, I'm, gonna, I'm using the uh, variable infiltration capacity VIC model, uh, which has been used uh, for a number of studies for uh, drought, both nationally and globally. It's a fully distributed uh, physically based water and energy balance model. And so um, what I'm showing for reference is the top one meter of soil. And this was an assumption, of course, that will affect the, the uh, se uh, severity of the results. 
basically to try to capture, of course, the shallow, sensitive surface soils, but also to um, go deep enough to really capture the rooting zone of, of the majority of the vegetation. And to try to get an independent estimate of you know, how accurate this is, I compared with the uh, US drought monitor. So this is August standardized anomaly versus mid-August. And of course, the drought monitor does have a, a model component in it, but is also comprised of other, um, other information. So we generally seem to capture things fairly well. I mean, we have the big signal in the center of the country and a few other minima, like in uh, northwest Nevada and even in the southeast. There's some correspondence, so that was good. Uh, for the, the growing season then, the average um, anomaly for that region was about a 1.3 sigma event. So I'll just keep that number in mind. Um, now, one of the nice things with using models is you can actually track the sort of time evolution of soil moisture deficits, which I'm showing here. These are just the monthly standardized soil moisture anomalies. One of the things that's been mentioned uh, elsewhere is that the previous October through April precipitation was near normal. So this was really a kind of a flash drought. And if you track the, if you look, you know, starting in um, January, February, March, and so on, the, the soil moisture really doesn't drop off until about June when things really um, plummet there. So that was kind of a useful way to look at it. Okay, so the um, simple experiment. So what were the real drivers behind the drought? And to do this, I wanted to isolate first um, the role of temperature. So what if we say, what if uh, precipitation was average? Okay, and so if we set um, precipitation to average, isolate the role of 2012 temperatures, uh, run the, the hydrologic model as before, except use daily climatological precipitation. And what you end up with is a, a very subtle drought signal when you isolate temperature. Uh, and compared to what I'm calling the sort of synthetic truth, which is the previous run, uh, with observed P and T, you see that you know you, you only capture a small amount of that signal, and the anomaly is on the order of about 0.4 sigma, which is like uh, a little over a quarter of that total anomaly. It's also likely that this is overstating the influence of temperature because we know that uh, from that scatter plot that precipitation and temperature are linked, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Okay, so the opposite case, simply what if uh, temperatures were average? So, you know, hypothetically, um, if we could isolate the role of precipitation, so running the model as before, and uh, except using daily climatological uh, temperatures, so what you end up with is a much larger uh, fraction of the, uh, of the anomaly. So we have something on the order of about uh, one sigma, which is about three quarters of the uh, total sort of synthetic truth there. So. Clearly, it was a precipitation-driven event, and actually, the uh, influence of precipitation here might actually be understated because precipitation deficits are usually accompanied with high temperatures. So to kind of get at that, a first attempt at that, really, uh, I'm going to do the last slide set here is to do with um, the time evolution of soil drying. So this is, these are just monthly soil moisture uh, standardized anomalies. What's interesting for 2012, you can see that in April, things were about average, and they really don't bottom out until July, so it's kind of a, a rapid onset there. The uh, meteorological anomalies that were in play, temperatures, of course, were high, uh, which is not um, surprising. Precipitation really drops off in May, and uh, it takes a while. There's a lag for the, the soil moisture to, to catch up, which is expected. So if we look at the so the moisture anomalies associated with these two cases, um, what we see is that the temperature contributed perhaps a small but persistent negative anomaly, uh, whereas precipitation really captures a lot of the variability of the soil moisture signal, which is not really that surprising. Um, as I was saying before, that, that the role of the precipitation in this experiment might be understated because recall that temperature and precipitation come together. That's due to the energetics at the land surface the Bowen ratio and so forth. So that um, if we wanted to correct uh, or adjust the role of precipitation and isolation, what I did was simply adjust the monthly temperatures during the precipitation deficit case according to this simple regression here between precipitation and temperature. And what you end up with is you know, an even larger fraction of the anomaly is uh, kind of explained by doing so. The same could be done for temperature. And that would probably reduce the influence 
a little bit and let us actually understand what the residual temperature influence on drought would be, which could be useful for a climate change analysis. So uh, in summary, 2012 was clearly precipitation driven. I think that disentangling the temperature precipitation relationship prior to the nonlinearities of the hydrology, which was through the model in this case, can uh, really lend for uh, good insights into this and other droughts. This, of course, is a first step, but could be applied and is actually uh, actively being applied to understanding how future climate may, um, what, what that may portend for drought uh, frequency. So finally, this is ongoing work, and I'm, I'm trying to move past just this simple precipitation temperature correction, working with ensembles of GCM data where we can get at the um, explicit uh, coupled land atmosphere interaction. So uh, with that, I'll leave you with this uh, image of a drought storm that followed sort of in the aftermath of the event uh, from the MODIS satellite. So thank you. Great. We have time for questions? Yes. Okay. Right, and I think there's probably, so the question was that it'd be interesting to try this with humidity, and I think there's probably you know, a strong linkage between temperature and humidity, of course, but I think that would probably add maybe the extra uh, insight there, yeah. Any more questions? What it did was actually took uh, monthly precipitation, and then I, I looked for uh, historical uh, months that had the closest to the average um, total amount of precipitation, and then I scaled those by the actual uh, long term. Yeah, so I didn't have like a climatological drizzle or anything like that. Great. No more questions? Great. Thank you so much.